gonna be just like senior year, except for funner. Hey everyone, I'm Kendra. And I'm Mercedes, and we're so excited to be chatting with the incredible writer, Carly Fortune. Yes, hello. hello, Carly. Today we're going to be talking about everything from Carly's work as a writer and her thoughts on rom-coms, one of our favorites, Bridget Jones's Diary. Yes, enjoy everyone. This is going to be a blast. First off, we really want to talk about your work as a writer. You're a journalist and a fiction author. So what has your writing journey looked like? Did you always have a goal for venturing into fiction? Yeah, I creative writing was my first love as a child. I remember in sixth grade, my teacher sent me to this one day writer's workshop and it was like my mind exploded. Like I, all I wanted to do was write and I loved it so much. But I was also very concerned about money as a child. I grew up in Barry's Bay where my book is set and it's a very small town. It's a working class town. My parents owned a restaurant. Restaurant industry is really tough. And I was pretty aware of financial struggle from a young age. And I was like, you know what? You can't make the living as a writer, as an author. So I decided to pursue journalism. <laughs> and anybody who is a journalist would be laughing at me right now because <laughs> it's not like this has to riches. But I loved magazines and I studied journalism at university and I became an editor because if you work in magazines in Canada, there are more jobs as an editor than there are as a writer. Writers are often mm -hmm. freelance and that scared me. So I became an editor and I worked as an editor for 16 years. I worked at our national newspaper, The Globe and Mail. I worked at Toronto Life, which is a magazine, kind of like New York magazine, but in, okay. in Toronto. I became the editor-in-chief of Chatelaine magazine, which is a women's magazine here. I quit after one issue to join Refinery29 and launch Refinery29 in Canada. So yeah, I oversaw that editorial team. And I always had in the back of my head the idea that I wanted to write a book. But it was one of those things I just thought I never would do, you know, like one of those bucket list items that just seems impossible. And in my job, I wrote now and then, but I was mostly editing. And then in the summer of 2020, work was, you know, work got more and more stressful as I rose up in my career. And in 2020, it was particularly challenging. And I got off a really tough call and I hung up the phone and I said, that's it. I'm writing my book. I don't know what that book is, but it feels really important to me right now to kind of reclaim my creativity. I hadn't done any creative work for myself as an adult. It had always been for an employer. And so I decided I'm going to write a book and I'm going to finish it by the end of the year and every summer after came out of that amazing wow oh my yeah. goodness i feel like we have a very similar story carly in the sense that like i also came from a low-income family and i was like i need to do something to make money and so i went into film <laughs> Of all things. But I also know I watched it and I consumed a ton of movies at the time. And I had specific people that I would look up to to keep inspiring me and to keep me going on this journey. And so I'm curious, who are some writers or like what are some stories that have inspired you along the way? You know, it's, you know, it's so funny. And I know that you've discussed this movie in a previous episode. But when I watched Legally Blonde as a teenager, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. Yes. <laughs> I am going to be a really sassy, badass lawyer. And for a while, I really considered studying law after doing journalism. And that movie just made it seem like Oh, I could do that. And like Elle Woods can be a lawyer. I can be a lawyer. But I was, you know, really inspired by magazines, just magazines, the like physical product of magazines was so fascinating to me. I had just like stacks of them in my in my bedroom, uh, YM and Seventeen and Teen and Vogue. My like entire bedroom wall was just covered in magazine spreads. And I just loved how words and pictures came together. And I didn't really have any idea of how you could get a job in magazines at the time, but I studied them like so, so closely. And I think that is what, you know, I didn't know what to do when I was applying to university. I didn't know what I was going to be. I loved writing. I knew that I could not be a writer, that that was impossible. And my friend said to me at a, we had this university fair where all the, the universities have their like, and colleges have their tables with mm -hmm. like their programs. And she's like, well, why don't you look at journalism? Because you love magazines so much. And that was really like a key moment for me. And then I think, you know, the other thing that was really influential was we had this television show in Canada called Fashion Television, which was um, like a fashion news program, a half hour show where uh, the host, Jeannie Becker, she's a legend, a Canadian legend, 
would go to all the fashion shows throughout the world. She would interview the designers and the models and that like door into the bigger world of like culture and fashion and music was kind of the only way I saw into that world. And that was really exciting to me as a teen. Wow. Amazing. Oh my goodness. We all find inspiration through different forms and in different avenues. And I want to know more about your writing process. Yeah. I'm really interested in what comes first, the character or the plot idea. Um, so for both of my books, neither. Um, so I I have Every Summer After, which is out now. And then next year, I have a new book coming out called Meet Me at the Lake. And with both of those books, the first thing that came to me was the setting. So I knew that I grew up in Barry's Bay down a dirt road in the bush on the lake. And we were one of the few year round residents on the road. And so cottagers would kind of come in and out of our lives seasonally. And I knew that I wanted to write about that place and um, being on a lake. And also, you know, I live in Toronto now. I've lived in Toronto for 20 years. Kind of the pull to the lake when you leave it, kind of, you know, the places in our hearts that we leave that still, you know, carry a lot of weight for us. And so that was the first thing that I knew with that book. And then my initial instinct was to write about a person who grew up like I did on the lake. And I was like, no, I'm going to write about Barry's Bay. My main character cannot be from Barry's Bay because everybody is going to think this is about me. <laughs> I made her, I made Percy, the city person who cottages at the lake. And then it was all about, I knew that she would have made this big mistake in her past and that she would have to confront it. And, you know, the other thing I really wanted to to explore was the problems some of us have when we're young with girls at school, with like those friendship bullying and, and dramas and kind of the power dynamics between girls. And so those ideas kind of came first. And then the character of Sam kind of came out of Percy, like who is her ideal friend, like the person who makes her feel safe and seen. And I had read my teenage journals early in lockdown before I started writing the book. And I felt so alone as a teenager. And even though I had close girlfriends, I just felt like nobody really understood me. I really wanted a boyfriend. I didn't have a boyfriend. And I wanted to give Percy that person. So that's how that kind of like all came about. And, and with my second book, it was like, where do I want to be when I write this book? Because writing is like reading where like, you were like immersed in this place with these people. And I'm like, so where, like, where am I going to hang out for the next year while I write this book? So that's <laughs> so far how it's worked. It's amazing how much of your stories are drawn from your personal experience, right? Like you have lived this entire life and it's so fulfilling, but I'm just curious when you're writing these stories and as a writer, how do you know when you're done? <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a good question. With every summer after... I, the way I tackled writing a book was I set myself a daily word count goal. So I figured out how many words I needed to complete a manuscript. It was 80,000 words I figured. And then I divided that by the number of days left in the year. And so that left me with 388 words. If I wrote 388 words a day, I would get a book done by the end of the year, or at least a first draft. And as an editor, I know that one of the like kisses of death for writers is editing yourself too much as you go along. So I did not self-edit very much until I got my first draft done. And I think, you know, I just let myself have fun and I really enjoyed writing. It was like the most fun I've, I've had in my life with any work. It was such a revelation. And when I read it back, then I printed it off and, and, and read it to myself. I was like, this is actually in pretty good shape. And I sent it to a few other people to read and got their feedback and some of it I was, wasn't sure about and some of it I incorporated. And I just kind of was like, I can't make this better at this point. Like I'm kind of done and I'm not somebody who like, I like wasn't going to sit with it for five years. That's not really how I work. And I was like, I cannot improve this. I need, I need somebody else's help. And that's when I started kind of, I felt like it was good enough shape to, to show agents at that point. And it's kind of the same with the second book where I now I have an editor who I know I'm working with. She knows like what the idea is, but it gets to a point where you're like, I don't know if what I'm doing is improving or if it is not helping at all. And you can't kind of see the project clearly. I think you're like, okay, and now I need, I need support. I need editing support. Love it. I love it. Yes. So I 
am a big every summer after fan. It's from oh, it's definitely yeah. in my top for 2022. Like I I just loved it. I like zoomed through it. So I'm really excited about Meet Me at the Lake. What Thank can you tell you. us about this book? I know it's out next year, but what else yeah. can you tell us? Yeah, so it's out May 2nd of next year. And it is a, it is a love story as well. It's about Will and Fern who meet in their early 20s, just as they've graduated from college. And they have this chance encounter that ends up kind of like spiraling into a day that they spend together in the city over 24 hours. And they kind of, you know, have this great connection. They share their secrets. They talk about their future and they make a pact to meet one year later. And Fern shows up and Will does not. And <laughs> I love your face right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then it, it, you cut to 10 years later and Fern is back home running her mother's lakeside resort, which is kind of like a dirty dancing style retro resort with like cabins on the water. And the place is in really bad shape. And her ex-boyfriend is the manager and she has never wanted to work there. She has never wanted to run this resort. And she needs help. And in walks Will, who she has not seen since the one day they spent together 10 years ago. Um, yes. He has this offer to help. And that day they spent together really changed Fern's life, like dramatically like altered the course of her life. And Will in the present is nothing like the person that she met 10 years ago. So she's trying to like figure out who this guy is, what happened to him and whether she can trust him. And the book, like every summer after, it has alternating timelines. So in the past, you spent like the day with Will and Fern kind of seeing their connection and seeing how this like impacts Fern's life. And then in the present day, you're at the resort on the, on the water for the summer. And there's this like really great cast of characters at the resort. And there's a really great friendship, like a best friend's storyline with Fern's best friend. And there's also like another little like element is Fern's relationship with her mother and Fern reading her mother's diary from the summer of 1990, which is the summer that she became pregnant with Fern. So it has Fern's mom's love story in there as well. And that's Meet Me at the Lake. It's like a little bit of mystery, like every summer after a lot of emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the sneak peek, Carly. It's wonderful. I want to move over to talking about like the actual genre of rom-coms. Yeah. Um, just like hearing about your likes, your dislikes and things like that. So I'm so sorry. I have to admit, I don't read a ton. I was born Don't and apologize. <laughs> I know I need to be better about it. No. Um, <laughs> no. I, I, I have so many thoughts on this, but don't apologize. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I was born and bred on movies and TV shows, which is why I ended up studying film, which is why I work in the entertainment industry now. But I'm just curious, as someone who writes so that people will like consume it, do you feel like people get the same feelings out of romantic stories as they do rom-com movies? And is that your hope for people to get the same feeling that they get from, from movies, essentially? Or do you want them to feel something deeper? Oh, that's such a good question. I think that, you know, when I write, I kind of picture it as a movie. Like I'm I'm like, oh, if you were trying to picture this in your head, could you see the scene playing out? And what does it look like? And where are like, where are the actors in space and how are they moving? And I really think of it visually as I write. I think the thing that books give you that movies have a tougher time delivering is that kind of internal emotional arc. So you can't see inside somebody's head as easily in film and TV as you can with books. And the emotional journey, I'm really interested in, you know, rom-coms and, and romances that have these emotional arcs for the characters beyond just the romantic storyline. But, you know, what else is kind of like happening in order for the romance to bloom? There's a, like, I love it when people are confronting other areas of their lives. And I think that like interiority is what makes books uh, special. And also the, in, like, I think there's an intimacy too with reading that is is really special. But I also like, I love film and TV too. And like, if I could, you know, my, my next book has a lot of music in it and reading song titles and band names or performer names does not give you, you know, I just didn't want to use it too much because as a reader, I find it doesn't, like you can't hear it. Like, even if you know the song, you're not like being immersed in the song. And when you watch TV shows or movies and the music adds so much and like, you know, the visual storytelling of setting and fashion, things that if you spend too much time on a book becomes quite boring. 
in a film, it like brings it to life. So I wish like there was some way to like have just like music playing in the back in the background of, <laughs> of my book. Did you guys watch the Summer I Turned Pretty series? Of yes, course, yeah. <laughs> the music is so awesome. Like yes. I, there was one episode where I was like, "Oh my gosh, the soundtrack on this episode is just making me so happy." <laughs> no, yeah, it was pretty wonderful. We loved it. Yeah, their yeah. music budget was through the roof. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So we know that every summer after, in part, is about a second chance romance. Yeah, a second chance love. So, do you have any favorite tropes or classic romance themes that you love seeing on screen or? Re- Reading, or also on the opposite end of that, ones that you just do not ever want to see again. <laughs> well, I love second chances and in reading in particular. I love when backstory yeah. is story because I think I really like angst <laughs> in general. <laughs> so I love a second chance romance. I also really love like an enemies to lovers or a nemesis to lovers or like where you think that he's not into you, but he is into you. I love that kind of tension. That's probably one of my one of my favorite tropes. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there is one. I feel like probably almost anything can be done well. And I don't read for as a reader, I'm not or even a viewer. I'm not looking for particular tropes. It's more like there are certain things that I'm drawn to more than other things. Like I think rom-coms for me have to have a pretty high bar in terms of the com. Like the com has to be really good. Um, (laughs) And in books, like I really am, like, as I said, I'm drawn to where there's like more, like something deeper going on, like in addition to like a really deep relationship, but like what else is happening in the book. And then there are two things like I can't, stand in either like film or books and one is when like it's just assumed that these people are going to get together and therefore there's like no kind of like much work make like yeah. explaining why they work what the attraction is and then especially in books when the characters aren't in enough scenes together I'm like no put them together I want to I want to see them interacting yeah so those are my likes and dislikes I would say that's so funny. Mercedes and I talk about this all the time about like our favorite tropes, our least favorite <laughs> tropes, and, and things like that. And it's so interesting, Carly, because I know you know you got two books under under your belt now. You draw so much from your life. Are there stories, or is there a story that that you've always wanted to write and you just have not gotten to yet? Maybe it's something that you conceived in your childhood and you just haven't put like pen to paper yet. And can you tell us that story and like why it's important to you? Oh, that's a good question. I think there are so many stories that I want to tell, and I don't even know them yet like that's kind of I think one of the exciting things about being alive is that we don't even know the things that we want to do yet for our entire lives Mm -hmm. I really like want to one of the things I've been thinking about is how to tell a story set in the media world one day because that is something that I am really you know I have so much experience in media and just that balance of like what a great romance would be that is set in media but is not like I'm a bit uncomfortable with like shenanigans happening within an office like Mm -hmm. the power dynamics of of office romances like I just don't know what that like what that book is is something I want to tackle one day I think yeah I don't know I really like I'm I don't even know like I'm also like really interested like I think one day in in telling maybe a YA story in the future a long long ways away but I'm very into right now the like the space that I'm occupying which is like I would say like emotional romance and like the term women's fiction I've opinions on but it's like women's fiction and romance which means that there is a central romance and there is a kind of an emotional journey for a woman in the story and as two things that kind of drive the book and I have so much I think I still want to do there and I I think more than stories sometimes because it's not always the first thing that comes to me is the idea for the story but like how a story is told in terms of structure and playing with those elements and those kinds of challenges are really interesting to me too so I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. No, it's just, it's very interesting. So thank you for sharing. I'm always wondering what oh. writers are like thinking about writing in the future. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so your book is major on TikTok. Book talk uh-huh. is obsessed with it. And something that happens a lot on TikTok is people fan cast the book with actors. So yeah. do you ever fan cast your books or have any actors in mind while you're creating the characters? 
That's such a good question. I don't typically have actors in mind when I'm writing a book. I can't really picture the characters, which I think people will find surprising because they're kind of like vague blurs to me. You know, I know they have a certain hair color and they're a certain height, but other than that, it's hard for me to like figure out what they look like. And I think it's for the reader really to interpret those descriptions and build their like character from there. So there's not really like any, I there's no, none of the characters I've written are like, look like any particular actor. Like I've heard people say that Charlie and Sam, who are the brothers in Every Summer After, should be the Hemsworth brothers, which I think is really <laughs> fun. But I'm so bad at this game, guys, because I'm so old <laughs> that like, I just think of like 90s actors. I'm like, are we casting with the cast of Dawson's Creek? Because if so, I can play this game. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my gosh. Speaking of 90s actors, we have to talk about this movie, Bridget Jones's Diary. Okay, so, I'm so excited. <laughs> admittedly, Carly, I just watched this movie for the first time on Sunday. Oh my gosh, what is my life? I oh, so oh, my life. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to hear a fresh take on it because I was obsessed with this movie as a teenager. Uh, and yeah. then re-watching it has been a very different experience. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's very funny. So I think I was meant to watch this movie at this time because I relate to Bridget so much. Just like her thinking that she's plus size, which I have some thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, but just like being plus size, uh, struggling to date, being in your 30s and everyone being like, oh, are you ever going to meet someone? Oh, you're a spinster and things like that, because that's definitely my life right now. Would love to be dating. Would love to be doing all of that. It's just not happening. And I, and I just turned 30 in May. So it's been a rough journey. But I feel like I... It was it was comforting to watch someone kind of having those feelings and having those th- those things being said to her like back in like 2001. Like it's still occurring now, right? And I just want to know, do you share any similarities with Bridget in any aspects of your life? That's a good question. So Bridget is a bit messy, I would say. Um, she has such low self-esteem and I think she struggles with feelings of unworthiness for sure, and trying to improve herself in order to attract a partner. And watching that as a teenager, I really related to her struggles. And I I loved the book also when I was a teenager. So I think one of the reasons why I liked it so much, because I've been trying to figure it out, is because I, I really identified with that. And I had a very unhealthy relationship with my body as a teenager. And I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this later because the film's relationship to body and weight is so ridiculous. But that those feelings of like, you know, feeling like you should be thinner um, and look a certain way and having people insult your weight, I really identified with that. So I think that teenage Carly identifies with Bridget so much more than adult Carly does. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing. You know, I'm. I guess I'm happy to hear that those same struggles you're not dealing with in your in your adulthood. Oh well, you know, our relationship, my relationship to my body is just changes all the time. But it's never. I'm like trying to like strive for just like neutrality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe that's like the goal. I think like positivity is like so some days sure, but it's a really really hard bar I think to me definitely um, yeah what I love about this movie is that like at its core it's a personal journey for Bridget and just to find herself and just grow as a person and really learn to love herself and so what advice would you give her as she enters the relationship with Mark Darcy at the end oh oh my yeah. goodness <laughs> I think that she needs to concentrate on her job and let her really totally. like, like ha- happen concurrent to her job. Like she gets this new job at a TV station. She's like at a publishing company. She has a relationship with her boss and decides to quit when that relationship goes south. And she gets this TV job. And I think that for Bridget, she is so focused on her romantic life that she needs to kind of balance where her her focus is really. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about that all the time. We have like a section in our podcast called Couples Therapy where we like to like give advice to the couples on how they can improve their relationship. Yeah. And a lot of our advice is like, ah, these people need to focus on themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is very true. It's very true. I want 
know, like, what is your favorite scene from this movie? Or what's a scene that you wish you could have been, like, an extra in? Or just at least... Oh, yes. Okay, so we should talk about, like, the cast of this film, which is um, Renee Zellweger as Bridget, Hugh Grant as Daniel, the boss and boyfriend, and Colin Firth as uh, Mark Darcy, who is her actual, like, love interest, real love interest in this film. And it is also, like, the casting is, like, a feat of meta casting. Um, yeah. I don't know, did you, do you know the, like, meta casting story behind this? Can I tell it? Because I'm so excited about yes, it. Yes, please share. Yeah, share. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bridget Jones's Diary is kind of, like, an update on Pride and Prejudice, which is, like, Shakespeare aside, one of the original rom-coms. Yeah. And I loved Pride of Prejudice, the book, and the BBC miniseries as a teenager, which stars Colin Firth as yeah. Mr. Darcy. And so when it was announced that Colin Firth was going to play Mark Darcy in Bridget Jones' Diary, I was like off my noodle excited. Like my <laughs> friends and I were just like, what? Mr. Darcy is going to play Mark Darcy? How? Like this is just like our minds were blown back in 2001. And like my friends and I like just loved it. Like we would sit in my bed and read lines from the book to each other like one of us would be like mark and the other would be bridget and like that's how ridiculous we were and so there is this scene in that bbc pride and prejudice where colin firth comes out of this lake he's like swimming in the lake in his clothes and he comes out of the lake and his shirt is just like plastered to his body <laughs> and it is like chef's kiss amazing and in Bridget Jones, there is a scene where there's two couples in rowboats and Bridget and Daniel, Hugh Grant, are like in the rowboat together. And Hugh Grant falls into the pond and emerges in this like this shirt that is like plastered to his body yes. in like, whew, he like, Hugh Grant is like <laughs> not really my type, but in that scene with the shirt. And he's got, he's like got aviators on and this like soggy cigarette coming out of his mouth. Like I would pay money to have been there. Like I think that it's like, um, so it was like, just like, it's just stupendous. Even I watched it again last night. I was like, oh, this movie is kind of worth it for this moment. (laughs) You're speaking my language. You're speaking, I'm like, I'm getting shy. Like, I know. Love it. Oh, I love it. Honestly, like Hugh Grant's like floppy hair. If I got to see that in person in the 90s when it was like peak, I I would pass out probably. And I like I think this like Hugh Grant as a cad is way better to me is yeah. preferable to Hugh Grant as like the bumbling um like Notting Hill Hugh mm-hmm. Grant. Like I much prefer like Hugh Grant as a like a bad actor for sure. Totally. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> So speaking of Colin Firth and Hugh Grant, who are like the two faces of British rom-coms, which of these heartthrobs is your favorite? You kind of hinted, you you lean toward more Colin Firth than oh, Hugh yeah. Grant, but like, just give us your love letter to Colin, to Colin Firth, because we all love Oh, him. so happily. <laughs> I think like, you know, one of the things that when I was, I made my husband rewatch this film with me over the holidays, because I, every so often I'm like, oh, you, I'm going to force you to watch this thing that I love. And I realized, and Bridget Jones is kind of a holiday movie. It starts with Christmas, ends with Christmas. And I realized I had never made him watch it. So we watched it together. And at the end, I was kind of like, huh. He was like, I didn't really enjoy that. I was like, ah, yeah, no, I didn't love this as much as I used to either. And I think one of the problems I had with it is that Colin Firth is not in it enough. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, oh my gosh, that man is like, he's, first of all, like the acting in this movie, like to me saves this movie. Like the charisma these people have is just like off the charts. And Colin Firth is just like his eyes and his chin. I feel like he is just such a beautiful man. And his clothes are ill-fitting in this film. And he's still (laughs) like so attractive. And like, to me, I wish he would like, I love a broody Colin Firth. I don't love like a, like trying to be funny Colin Firth as much. Still love it. Like I'll take him any, any day of the week, (laughs) but I would have liked a little more brooding from him. He's got a lot of puppy dog eyes and a lot of like sweetness that is so nice, but he just like, he's got such a good brood. And I just, I just want a little bit more of that. But yeah, I I love like the accent, the height, the eyes, yes, everything. Oh, he has the kindest eyes. I love (laughs) it. But they can also be very steamy. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I wanted more steam. Mm. (laughs) 
I, I love that. Carly, it has been so amazing talking to you in the rom-com room. We have covered so many topics today. We talked about you as a writer, your writing journey, how you feel about rom-coms, romance novels, and also your favorite Bridget Jones's diary. We cannot thank you enough again for being on the rom-com room. Can you please tell people where they can find you and where they can find your books? Yeah, so I'm uh, mostly on Instagram at Carly Fortune, and my name is spelled C-A-R-L-E-Y. And then also on my website, CarlyFortune.com. And my books, you can find them everywhere. Every Summer After is pretty much everywhere, and you can pre-order Meet Me at the Lake now. Yay! Wonderful. We'll make sure to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carly. It was great having you here. Thank you. (laughs) Yes, this has been amazing. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy you got to join us here. Me too. Hey guys, I'm Kendra. Hi, and I'm Mercedes, and this week we're talking about one of my favorite love triangles of all time in Bridget Jones's diary. Yes, of course. Well, of course. Mercedes, we have to talk our celebrity crush of the week. Who are you crushing on this week? So this is no surprise if you listen often, Nico Haraga. <laughs> I just want to give him a shout out because, you know, I adore this boy. Yes. And he just finished filming a rom-com that's planned to release next year. And something I really appreciate about him is the majority of the films he's in are directed by women. And he hasn't been in a lot, but the majority, like he's only been in one that hasn't been directed by a woman. And I don't know if this is an intentional decision he makes, but I just want him to know that it doesn't go unnoticed. And I really appreciate seeing his filmography. (laughs) <laughs> thank you Nico Haraga <laughs> for your contribution <laughs> to women in film. yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> so a few months back Chris Evans did a like shot a land interview where the interviewer asked him like what are you hyper focused on do you know the interview I'm talking about oh do I know it yes uh, I have the okay. audio saved on my TikTok <laughs> okay Okay, so it was, yeah, it was a question along those lines. So this is just for anyone who doesn't know because Mercedes already knows. He talked about how he's currently hyper-focused on finding a partner and like someone to spend his life with. And I even just like saying it right now, I tear up because I watched that clip again last night because I have it saved on my TikTok as well. Like, And I just, it's just so honest and vulnerable. And I just, I feel bad because obviously Chris Evans is a good looking guy. So I feel like he gets kind of, dismissed when it comes to feelings like that like people are like yeah oh why are you fit? you're chris i'm your captain america you can find anyone but like no it is actually really genuinely hard to find someone who will add value to your life and especially like if you are someone of chris evans status where you already have everything like you do need that person that still adds value so it makes it like i think even more difficult and i just i don't know it just gives me hope a bit like to hear him say that and also hope that like hey maybe i'm the one that he's been looking for <laughs> I support it. We know you yes. love a Boston boy. I love, I love, oh my God, I so love Boston boys. I literally had a day where I just watched, I just watched all of Ben Affleck's movies that he directed. I watched God, Baby God. I watched The Town. I was like, I just love, I watched The Departed. I was like, I just love Boston. Like, during <laughs> It's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> Guys, we're going to move over to TLDR before I can continue to embarrass myself. We just like to recap the movie for anyone who has not seen it. Warning, there are spoilers ahead. So if you haven't seen this movie, you can stream it on Netflix. Take it away, Mercedes. Yes. Bridget Jones, played by Renee Zellweger, is 32 and single and can't seem to get any aspect of her life in order. At her parents' New Year's party, she's introduced to a divorced barrister, Mark Darcy, played by Colin Firth, and the two both leave the interaction annoyed by one another. Bridget goes home and makes a resolution to turn her life around and starts keeping a diary to mark her journey to stop smoking and drinking, lose weight, and to find a man. At work, her boss, Daniel Cleaver, played by Hugh Grant, suddenly takes an interest in her. The two start with flirtatious banter and eventually begin dating. All the while, Bridget seems to run into Mark Darcy at every event, and she learns from Daniel that Mark used to be his best friend until he slept with Daniel's fiancé. Things take a turn in Bridget's relationship when she catches Daniel cheating and the two break up. Now on a path of self-improvement, she finds a new career and cuts him out of her life. Then she crosses the paths with Mark again, where he apologizes for their initial meeting and confesses that he likes her, just as she is. Bridget's feelings grow for Mark, and she begins to see him in a different light. When he shows up at her birthday dinner, she's impressed by his consistent willingness to help her. The night turns chaotic when Daniel shows up drunk and unannounced. Then he and Mark fight in the street. Bridget ends up rejecting both men afterward. 
She soon learns the truth that Daniel was the one who slept with Mark's wife, and she apologizes to him and confesses her feelings at his family's party. This doesn't go as planned as Mark is set to move to New York for work, and Bridget is left brokenhearted. Later, as Bridget's friends convince her to go to Paris with them, Mark shows up at her apartment. The two finally kiss in the street after he buys her a new diary, and in typical Bridget Jones fashion, she is standing in the snow wearing nothing but a sweater and tiger print underwear. And they live happily ever after. (laughs) Happily ever after. This is a 2001 film written by Helen Fielding, who also wrote the sequels. Andrew Davies, who wrote House of Cards. And Richard Curtis, who wrote some of our faves like Love Actually, Four Weddings and a Funeral, About Time, and Pirate Radio. Amazing. my side is tell me tell me all the facts tell me all the facts i have i have so many facts for you i got facts for me (laughs) (laughs) this movie was adapted from the 1996 novel of the same name written by helen fielding which came out from her success as a columnist for her column also by the same name and the story is inspired by Pride and Prejudice, hence Mark Darcy. So it's even better that Colin Firth plays Mark Darcy since he played Mr. Darcy in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice. Iconic. Yeah. I iconic, love it. iconic. I have to say, though, where it is, if we're talking about Pride and Prejudice, like adaptations, 2006, Joe Wright, Kira Knightley, Matthew McFadden, yep. that's my Pride and Prejudice. I have it a always wins. My hand. It always wins. It always wins. I have a tattoo on my hand that says your hands are cold because that's what oh, that's what Kira yes. Knightley says to Mr. Darcy at the end when he's like I love you and she's like your hands are cold so oh. I just it has a little sunrise too because you can see the sun peering through them like oh. <laughs> it's tattoo. it's perfect and then never forget his hand after he yes. helps her into the carriage the hand yes oh, oh. my god I that know movie what it is about that <laughs> I can watch it any day. It, it came out on my birthday the year it came out. Yeah, so now it's just a permanently a part of me. <laughs> oh, love it. You are so lucky. I love it. I'm jealous. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny that this movie ends with her, like, running in the snow in her, in her underwear. Because I was screaming at that scene. But then I was happy to find out that actually the snow scenes were actually filmed during the summer. Which makes sense. Because I was like, girl, you yeah. have to get hypothermia for a man. Like, can we? For real. Can what we if not? she fell? <laughs> Imagine ice. Yeah. Like, or like... <laughs> Or just like, you know, it's a city, you're in London, mm-hmm. that snow is not, like, clean, like, nope. it sh- they should have showed a little more dingy, <laughs> like, imagine. <laughs> I was worried for her, but I'm glad, I'm glad it was so during the summer. <laughs> Thank goodness. So, other actors considered for the role of Bridget Jones were Helena Bonham Carter, Kate Blanchett, Rachel Weisz, Tony Collette, and Kate Winslet, like, stacked Ooh options and Zellweger spent weeks working undercover at a British publishing firm and mm-hmm. even hired a dialect coach to help her perfect her genuinely convincing Bridget British accent to in this role mm-hmm. and we know she also gained weight for the role too and honestly like the, the hard work went into it because then she ended up with the Oscar nomination for best actress like very impressive mm-hmm. very impressive and her <laughs> accent is so good it is. It's it's on yeah. point, one hundred percent. It's funny that like all of these other actresses that were considered were actual British actresses. And I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have. I think if if it wasn't Renee Zellweger, I would have loved to have seen Kate Winslet in this. It's funny. I always uh, think about this. You know how her and Leo are like best friends. Mm-hmm. I remember reading an interview. Kate had just. I don't know. She was she was fat growing up, right? She was she was a bigger girl mm-hmm. growing up. And when they were on the set of Titanic, and I think she was sharing something with Leo, Leo just straight up goes, listen, you're going to have to let go of that fat girl thing at some point. Like, and she said that was like, the moment, like changed everything for her. I know, which is kind of, mm, I don't know. But like, <laughs> she said that was the moment that yeah. kind of like changed everything for her. Because like, she was Kate Winslet, right? It's like, yeah, <laughs> she's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. No matter what she looks, she's just spectacular. I think Absolutely. I would have loved to see Toni Collette. I love Tony mm. Collette, and okay. I just I think she would have gotten like the quirkiness of Bridget Jones so well. I agree. I agree. Yeah, she definitely. Would. Also, yeah. my favorite fact: the yes. fight scene wasn't choreographed; it was improvised. How do you improvise throwing someone through a window? I'm curious. <laughs> I, I always think about that, and I'm just like, I wonder what they used for the glass. Like I always think because they land on all of like the broken pieces, so I'm like, what yeah. did they use for this? Well, it's plexiglass, right? It's always plexiglass. I I don't, it just seemed just so painful (laughs) that I'm just, and oh gosh, I don't know. I never put me in a fight scene. (laughs) If I'm saying this correctly, which I'm going to be embarrassing because I definitely studied this in school and I remember. So plexiglass are like glass like that they use to shatter when they like, you know, take a bottle and bring over something. 
it's basically made out of like sugar water so it's not mm-hmm. like sharp it's not it just gives the effect of glass but it's not actually like sharp but i hear what you're saying i hear i hear what you're saying, um, I'm saying. <laughs> i that you could never catch if i was an actor you could never catch me doing my own stunts it would not yep. happen <laughs> No Marvel movies for Mercedes. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Guys, we're going to move over to Time Capsule Mercedes. And I just like to recap where we were when we watched this movie, which I am ashamed to admit, I had never seen this movie in its entirety before this weekend. And I don't even have a good reason why. I just, I don't have a good reason why. I completely take the blame for it. <laughs> this is an iconic movie. And I know that it was. I just, I just never got around to it. I don't know what it was. We all we all have a movie like that that we're just like I don't know why I haven't seen it I just haven't seen yeah it. I feel like I have more movies like that though than the average person. I mean but there are so many movies out there that I think we yeah. all just have movie like I get so overwhelmed that sometimes I'm like I'm just gonna rewatch what I love because I can't yeah. I can't make the choice one hundred percent where were you where it is I was four years old when this came out but I've been watching it for years it will always remind me of my mom because she is like a Jane Austen stan so obviously we love all the adaptations in this house and we are also like a firm like Colin Firth house I love Hugh Grant but my mom like loves to bring up his 90s scandal anytime I rave about him so we're like very Colin Firth wait what's his 90s scandal you don't know? Oh, wait, Hugh Grant, did he sleep with a nanny? No, he, he I, <laughs> I don't even, so he, 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 yes, he cheated on his, like, supermodel girlfriend with a sex worker. He was, like, paparazzi, like, in the street. Ah, uh, so <laughs> t- typical male fashion, essentially. Like, yes, exactly. <laughs> like, of course, you know, like, so, yeah. one, just one of those, like, hot actor stereotypes, but. Okay, got it. Okay. Well, that was like I'm not surprised by that. <laughs> it's just a scandalous. <laughs> a scandal. Everyone does a scandal. So I remember in 2001, I was nine years old, and you know, Mercedes, like from doing so many episodes with me, I literally cannot remember fifth grade. Like that is the elusive <laughs> era for me, and I always yeah. say that. But it's so funny because I, as I was thinking, like as I was writing my notes for this episode. I realize I think the reason I can't remember fifth grade is because I always I have tied every year in grade school, and middle school to who I had a crush on at school. Yeah. I don't think I had a crush on someone at school in fifth grade. I think I had a crush on someone at church in fifth grade. And that's why I can't remember it. I know. I figured it out. I freaking figured it out. I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> that's a, I'm so smart because I yeah, I think like that's the best way to map out like childhood is through crushes. Mm, yes, exactly. Because yeah. I'm like, okay. First grade was Sean. Second grade was was this person. Third grade was Andrew. Fourth grade was was the other John. Fifth grade. And I'm like, okay, I had a crush on someone at church. That's why I can't remember. And church is not like, oh, you go to a different... It's like c- continuously the same. Yeah. The so um, couldn't tell you who I had. I probably, probably this kid Jordan that I grew up with. I probably had like the biggest crush on him. But yes, that's who I was crushing on when this movie came out. How about you? What were you doing? I was four. I hadn't even started <laughs> school. Yeah, it was like preschool vibes. So <laughs> I think I was just crushing. Uh, now everyone knows that I had the biggest crush on Danny Zuko in Greece. Yes. So I think him and then Sean Hunter, Boy Meets World. That's when I really started watching like reruns of Boy Meets World. So I was like in it. I was dedicated. Oh, oh. my gosh. You know, Boy Meets World is on Disney Plus. And I started watching. Yes, I started I watch, I've watched it all the time. Oh, yeah. I watched Boy Meets World, Even Stevens, and Lizzie McGuire. I love that. Yes! <laughs> oh, I love Lizzie. I know. She's so great. So iconic. <laughs> Guys, it's time for the Rob Cop Hall of Fame. But of course, Mercedes, we got to roast this movie. Tell me what does not age well. The number one thing for me in this is the idea that Renee Zellweger is overweight in mm-hmm. this movie. It's yep. so insane. And it's like this 90s, early 2000s obsession with thinness and that toxic diet culture that is still like far from gone. Like we still see it all the time. It just takes different forms and different wording. But but it's just so blatant and I don't know the comments she receives from even strangers in this movie are so cruel and her body is thin just normal thin woman body I don't know what else to say and it's discussed in this movie as being so unacceptable Mm -hmm. and I roll my eyes every time because it's so frustrating and apparently like afterwards she like made comments about like oh I gained the weight for the role and then I lost it right away I don't know why anybody stays like overweight and it's like okay you 
have no <laughs> grounds to speak on anyone's body image. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. So early 2000s. It really is. I actually recently heard this story that kind of broke my heart that is in a similar vein to, like, Bridget Jones in the sense of, like, this girl is bigger and she recently received attention from this guy who was like conventionally attractive and Mm. they actually started dating like he actually is like a great guy really nice to her but he does not want to be seen with her in public and she Mm. feels like okay i deserve that because i look this way but at least he like when we're together he treats me right like he respects me he does like he tells you that he loves me all of this stuff he just doesn't want to be seen with me in public and i feel like a lot of that mentality it's so interesting how our perceptions of what is beautiful not only negatively affect women but they also negatively affect men men think Mm -hmm. i should only like this type of woman this woman who looks this way those are types of people i should go after and if i'm interested in anything else it is wrong and it just breaks my heart because you know it started with movies like this like you know yes like this for a time yeah and it just it breaks my heart um oh my god yeah I i think another rose for me is just I mean, I relate to this as someone who is 30 and single and has been perpetually single basically my entire life. Just like the fact that when she's at the party and Mark is like, she's a 32 year old spinster. Like, I was so mad about that. Like, I know. I just, it's just so rude because here's the thing I never in a million years thought it would be this difficult to find love, but also, too, it is very difficult to find love just in general. Mm-hmm. Like, it is difficult to find that person who's going to elevate your life. So for you to mock someone because of their age. And I know. Yet, Never like... shame anybody for that. <sighs> it's also really interesting because in the book, she's two years older. And then in the movie, they made her younger. And I mean, two years isn't that big of a difference. But I think it does speak to like, um, I don't know, like what we want to portray. Because yeah. obviously, like the movie is going to be more widely seen than the book is going to be read in most cases. So it is interesting that they're like, no, yeah, 32 spinster. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. just absurd. Also, like, get spinster out, spinster out of your vocabulary. Like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> also, who's a spinster uh, for? <laughs> exactly. And OK, my other roast is her boss is hitting on her and like eventually dating her and it's that's seen as like a good thing in this movie like my only advice to Bridget is call HR like are you serious yes (laughs) screenshot all those IMs and go to HR (laughs) sexual harassment okay this is an inappropriate question and you don't have to answer and that's totally fine okay if Nico Harago was your boss for sentence like you worked at this cool media company and Nico Harago just happened to like own the own the media company and he was like hey what's that is I wouldn't accept like flirtation from Mm -hmm. like a power dynamic yes I would like be like okay leave and then we can date yes. or like knock down your title a couple or like any I don't know but Sorry. it's comp I know it's complicated mm. but not for me but also <laughs> Daniel is an eco horror so that it's, it's yeah, it's yeah also like back. in what world but whatever <laughs> What is your favorite quote from this movie? My favorite quote is... Harry, I like you very much. Just as you are. Mm. And it just melts my heart. Like, And I love how when she tells her friends, she, they're all just like, just as you are. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> it's very cute. It's very cute. It's funny. My favorite quote happens when she's like telling him the same thing. And in the midst of it, she goes... I seriously believe that you should... Rethink the length of your sidebands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Oh my gosh. Mercedes, if this movie pops up on your Tinder feed, are you swiping left or are you swiping right? I am swiping right. I think this movie does so much in how it blends relatability with like how exaggerated the humor is. We get yeah. to see one of like the best movie fights between Hugh Grant and Colin Firth set to It's Raining Men. It's iconic. I love it. <laughs> um, plus, we also have scenes of Bridget Lee getting ready for events in such a relatable way. Like, like waxing and like doing all this maintenance stuff that like is just like the harsh reality like she's never effortless and her clumsiness and like her ability to never say the correct thing isn't seen as this like silly quirk she has or something that she overcomes it's just a part of who she is it's her personality and I just love how the story focuses more on her character development than the romance and then the romance isn't 
this gift because she has any self-improvement. It's all because Mark Darcy just likes her the way she is. And that's really what matters. And we get to watch Bridget live her life and come into her own in her 30s, in her romance with her friends, her family, and work all included in that journey. Like a lot happens in this movie. And Bridget's character growth is just for her. And I love that because... I love how she lands this man that she's meant to be with by just being her normal self. And he like observes her through like all those cringeworthy moments and loves her for that. Yeah. Mm, of course it is. He just made me, yeah. he just made me cry. I should love it. <laughs> I 100% agree with everything that you said. Um, and I am swiping right as well. I'm a sucker for any form of entertainment with British accents anyways. So yeah. uh, but then you throw Hugh Grant and Colin Firth in there, two of the sexiest men at that time. I am all Truly. in. Truly. I am all oh. in. My, my reasons are always way less analytical than yours, but I'm like, yeah, they're hot. Let's swipe right. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I have told my friends multiple times, I don't like to watch movies without hot people. Yeah, there <laughs> you go. Guys, it's time for couples therapy. We like to give advice to the couples on how they can improve their relationship. And I would love to hear what you think, Mercedes. I'll let you go first. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing here for me is just like learn how to communicate productively and have mm -hmm. patience. Both of these people are complicated and flawed, just like any real relationship. Mm -hmm. So just have patience and really care for one another. Be gentle. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I also think they should let go of fear, Mercedes. Yeah. There's a lot of fear surrounding both of them of like what the future may hold or how each other will feel. Or And I would say I just feel like they need to develop a level of comfort around each other yeah. at first and just not be afraid to be vulnerable because that's what it's going to take for this for this to work. But also, too, I think it's very interesting because I feel like this is one of the first rom-coms we've watched where I feel like the main character embodies all five love languages or needs Ooh. all five love languages. So I think she was generally happy when all of the so like acts of service when mark was helping her with her birthday meal right yeah. gifts when he buys her a new diary physical touch which was her whole relationship with daniel words of affirmation when mark tells her that he likes her just the way that she is and she kind of harbors on those words the rest of the film and then quality time with with both men right it's essentially like talking and, and being around them it's just in, enjoyable so I feel like Bridget is all five of those. That's so insightful, Kendra, because honestly, like, that's what the love languages are supposed to be. Like, we need everything here. And, like, the quizzes just tell us, like, what we prefer. But, like, that's so true. Like, she really does embody everything and, like, needs all of these things because she's just been without them mm -hmm. and, like, hasn't been loved and cared for in the way that she rightfully deserves. And yeah, I think like words of affirmation is major here. Obviously, like this is narrated through her journal and that's where she's like expressing all of these, like the range of feelings she has for Mark Darcy through time. Mm -hmm. And I also think like he is such like he needs quality time because he's so observant and awkward and kind of aloof in that way. And that's how he really falls for Bridget is just watching her from the side. Yeah. And I think he gives acts of service through helping her like for the dinner and buying her the new diary and then also like her interview the like big interview she got um for her job like that's so important i don't know like he like he saw the opportunity to help her and he just went for it yeah. and i love that <laughs> love it so okay does this couple last in five years yes they are meant to be i haven't watched the sequels in a while so i don't i can't really remember what happens <laughs> You know I haven't seen them at all. So I, I would actually say, yes, I think, I think they're old enough and mature enough to understand their feelings and make it work, which we don't often get characters like that. So it's nice to be able to say that. Yes. <laughs> all right. It is time for Heartthrob. Mercedes and I just like to gush over who we love in the movie. And I feel like this is another one we're going to agree very, very strongly on, Mercedes. Who is Polly Ash in this movie? Mark Darcy. Mark Darcy. He, he's perfect he is first of all grumpy which we know i love he's awkward <laughs> and he's sweet and he's non-threatening which we talk about probably weekly here <laughs> it's a very important quality <laughs> and colin Firth just like wins at being so charming with the kindest eyes and you just want him to like hold you but also hugh grant's hair like what a man <laughs> what a man i just want to run my fingers through this 
I know. It's just, I love the way it flops. Oh my gosh. Yes. 100% agree. I still love Colin Firth to this day. I need to watch The Staircase yeah. on HBO. Like, I, Ooh, I, yeah. Guys, we're going to play Barry Smooch Ghost. We have Mark Darcy, Daniel Cleaver, and let's say Bridget's friend, the one who wrote the hit song. Who <laughs> 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 you ghosted? Okay, obviously I'm going <laughs> to... That, I'm sorry, that made me laugh. <laughs> I'm going to marry Mark Darcy. I'm going to smooch Danielle Cleaver because he's so beautiful. And I'm going to ghost Bridget's friend because I don't think he's really interested in me. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> More interested in if you heard his hit song back in the 90s. <laughs> exactly. I agree with you. I agree. I have a question for you. If you had to choose two movie heartthrobs to be in a love triangle with, who would you choose? Oh, it's kind of, it's honestly one of the hardest questions I've ever asked. This is the hardest question anyone has ever asked me in my 30 years of planning. <laughs> if I had to choose between two movie heartthrobs to be in a love triangle with, who yeah. would I choose? Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, do they have to be from the same movie? No, no, no. They don't even have to be from like the same generation. Oh, no, that's they... worse. <laughs> you have that's endless opportunity here <laughs> oh my god wait that's so much worse okay wait okay hold on hold on hold on oh my god oh wait you answer the question first <laughs> okay it's so hard and i was thinking about it honestly all night and i was like who would be like so good in this dynamic and like who would i want to like fight for me like duel for me you know mm -hmm. and i think i would want james marsden and chris pine <gasps> I love it. You know, because okay. they're kind of like the same category of man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of an thinking, even playing field. Yeah. You're thinking actors. See, I'm thinking like actual characters. So Ooh. I think I would have I think I would have said Lloyd Dobler from Say Anything. Of course. He is my dream guy. And then also to Ray Fines from Made in Manhattan. Whoa. <laughs> I know. I was not I was not expecting that. I just love him. And I love his character in that movie and I love him. I love him as an actor. So I think Louis very... Dobler would get him. Ugh, I don't know. I think <laughs> he'd be <laughs> intimidated by him, but he'd be so like, "Hey, you know, you're you're a politician. That's really cool. I love Kendra though, so you should let me have her because I just they wouldn't her. even like fight. <laughs> yeah, he would just like yeah. talk him down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's what I love about Lloyd. That's what I love about him. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys before we wrap it up we always love to bring it a pop culture moment what do you got from your side is yeah so like i said there's been two sequels of bridget jones and apparently there's been a musical in the making since 2009 and there's no word if it will ever like come to light but i'd love to see it the music in this movie is so fun anyway that i'd love to see like what they actually do with like song choices to like tell this story and then also my other fun fact is shirley henderson plays bridget's friend jude who's often seen crying in the bathroom and we all probably know Henderson best as playing Moaning Myrtle in Harry Potter. And I just think it's crazy that someone who has been typecast as a bathroom crier. If <laughs> all of these you can be typecast. Like exactly. <laughs> They're like, you look like you've been sad in a bathroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Speaking of Harry Potter, though, both the Bridges' parents in here, Jim Brock yes. and Jim Jones, they both played characters in Harry Potter. So we got a whole yeah. Harry Potter family in here. Those British people, they've all they were all on Harry all in Harry Potter. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So uh, we have some sadder news for listeners out there. The rom-con room is coming to an end. But yeah, having this opportunity has been so special to me. And I don't take this ending lightly at all. I've been very emotional about it. But I'm just so grateful that we had the chance at all. And that Kendra and I have like grown such a bond through this. And been on this journey. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who listened. As well as everyone who we interviewed. You were all so wonderful. And it was so great to get your insight. And just thank you to rom-coms. Because we will always rewatch them. And we will always love them. And there are just so many more that we didn't even get to discuss that are just out there for us to love on our own. Yes, definitely. I feel like I've grown so much and not just like my movie knowledge, but mm -hmm. just my understanding about love and relationships. It's been such a pleasure getting to share these films and just bring so much joy. And we're always happy to talk about them with you listeners. Thank you for listening to my co-host Mercedes. You are one of my favorite people to talk to about this genre mm -hmm. with. I learned so much from you and your insight and your knowledge. And I cannot thank you enough for this experience and to meet Q as well. 
thank you for giving us this opportunity to be able to talk about the things that we just simply love, which are rom-coms. Yes, thank you, Meet Cute. (laughs) So guys, make sure to slide into our DMs at Meet Cute. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Kenton Hollywood. And for the last time, my name is Kendra. Yes, and I'm Mercedes. You can find me at MercedesGB11 on Twitter, IG, and TikTok. And if you're looking for new rom-coms, follow Meet Cute wherever you listen to podcasts and follow Meet Cute on socials everywhere. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Hi, Meet Cuties. We're so excited to let you know that you can now binge our newest series, Influence, exclusively and ad-free on Wondery+. Plus. It's Meet Cute's modern adaptation of Jane Austen's Persuasion, and we know you're going to love it. 